This is our last look at Titus and what Paul is teaching Titus that is equally relevant to us in our days today. So far we've learned that Titus needed to silence the people who said Christians must add rules to their faith to be saved. Remember, rules limit our godliness and they in themselves have no power to motivate us to godly living. Rules and the fear of breaking them do not make for good motivation. Not that sort of fear. Fear and awe of God and the gospel story is and should be our only motivation. We each face different challenges in our godly living depending on our age and our stage of life. However, it is only when we live in self-controlled ways that the gospel is attractive to family, to community, to the people we meet day by day. Christ's coming brought us grace and our future is the coming glory of his presence. We are his people living between grace and glory and it, and it is this that should give us the passion, the eagerness, the want and the ability to say no to ungodly living and live the gospel story for all to see. So Paul finishes this letter to Titus by stressing several things. Some things we don't particularly want to hear or admit, such as uncomfortable truths about ourselves. We are foolish, disobedient, easily misled. We give in to the pleasures all around us. You'll find that in the scriptures in this last chapter of Titus. Before grace filled us and changed us, we were full of envy and evil. Whether we want to admit it or not, and because of those things, it was hard for us to see or hear God. But God, Yahweh, appeared amongst us. And this is Paul's way of saying God's salvation came in the form of Jesus. It was full of his kindness and love and because of his mercy. Nothing, absolutely nothing that we have done could do or would ever have done, have initiated or begun or brought about the salvation that Jesus brought to us. Pure love, such as we really can't describe. We may think we know love, but we only really know it in a human form and no words or actions come even close to the pure love God had when he sent his son for our salvation. Just sitting with that thought for a moment or two can become quite overwhelming. On top of that, he also sent his Holy Spirit to bring us this new birth in God. Through his grace, he poured it into our hearts and lives. I wonder if you've ever considered how much you think Jesus is worth to the Father. How much do you expect the Spirit to be at work in your life? And that might depend on how much you think Jesus is worth to the Father. Have a think about Niagara Falls for a moment. Imagine the water cascading over the edge of the falls. You got a picture of that? It's estimated that there's 344,366 litres of water that fall over the edge every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day. More than we can ever think or imagine. It continually cascades, never ending over the edge. And this is a mere snippet of God's grace poured out generously over us, over and over and over. And it's the only way I could think of to describe or measure God's kindness and love and grace and salvation and what Jesus is worth to him. And even then I feel I've failed dismally. Verse 3 to 5 remind us that we have nothing to be proud about. The list of things we'd rather not admit or look at, nothing we did brought about salvation in us or for us because it's all about Jesus. Let me say that again. It's all about Jesus. We bring our sin and he brings love and grace, mercy and salvation. We may see worthlessness and hopelessness, but God sees us. And it, ne it's an, and it never ever prevents his grace. In fact, it probably spurs him on to bring us towards him, to bring us the best 
to bring us love and mercy which are never withheld but offered over and over and over again like a cascading, never-ending waterfall. Paul finishes his letter with some pretty stern advice and some strong language. Sub submit to government. Be obedient, ready to go do good. Be peaceful, not slandering or quarrelling with each other. Put away divisive things. I'm reminded of Jesus' teaching when he talks about a divided kingdom will fall. Paul reminds us that traditions and uh, spiritual pedigrees, rules you may have so consciously kept, avail to nothing and are a waste of time. Paul's words in verse 6. Church, Christians, those who profess to love God, it's time to refocus on the gospel story. Not on what does or does not suit me, but on the gospel story, on what God wants, on where he guides us, on his story of grace and salvation, love and mercy, on living a godly life. And if this generation don't or want or won't do that, I ask it again, who will? Who will? It has been said of the Christian church, it is but one generation from extinction. And I ask again, if I won't live for Yahweh, if I don't pursue a godly life, if we collective don't, who will? Yahweh, we come seeking your presence and your words for us, for this generation, for this church of yours. Thank you for so lovingly giving without judgment, giving with so much mercy, even as we don't deserve it. We confess that we don't always get it right, but Yahweh, grant us the courage to admit it, to confess where and when we get it wrong, and remind us that we confess to your loving mercy and that your grace changes and amazes us all at the same time. We humbly ask for your power, your courage, your strength and guidance to be your people. Enable us to live godly lives building the church with the gospel story by who we are and what we do in and through your love and grace, salvation and mercy. May the gospel story be our one motivating story, your story lived out in our generation, in our times for all people. May the gospel story be seen in us today and always for you and you alone.